Thank you, Nana. Uh, so uh, first of all, a uh, very happy Women's Day to all of you. And as Nella was saying, I think I think Women's Day this year is more special because we need more feminism and more solidarity as a result of the war which we're witnessing in Ukraine. And I think these um, yeah these these talks and these ref collected reflections are needed. Um, for today's uh, session, which is Solidarity is at Work, uh, we have a wonderful speaker, which is uh, Chinzia Priola. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in organization studies uh, at the Department of People and Organizations um, at Open University. And her work includes, um, uh, different, of course, like she's a quite intersectional researcher, uh, but her work broadly includes work um, gender and sexual um, identities in organizations, equality and diversity. Um, and uh, with that, I will pass it on to Dr. Cinzia Priola. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to thank Nella and uh, Louise for organizing uh, today's International Women's Day conference, for inviting me to speak. Um, I want to thank all colleagues. Uh, but I want to spare a thought um, for the women who are in the middle of a war. Uh, a war done by men, for men. Um, and I'm thinking about the Ukrainian women and the Russian women who are dying, who are fleeing, who are protesting, who are being silenced. Uh, so I'm thinking about all victims of war. The title of my presentation, as you can see, is Getting It Wrong, Right and Wrong Again. The journey from ideology to praxis. Um, obviously, there is no journey with between ideology and um, or theory and practice. And ideology is itself also a practice, uh, particularly when we are talking about feminist ideology. Uh, the journey, therefore, is a sort of mental, emotional journey. It's an exploration about what we can do and how we can translate beliefs or theoretical concept into political practice. Sorry, um, before I move on. Um, oh gosh, because I'm using a, a laptop and I'm using, I'm used to have a mouse, I'm making it a bit of a mess. So, um, the first part of the title also might appear to refer to my experience, getting it wrong, right and wrong again. Um, but I don't want this presentation to be a self-indulgent talk. Equally, at the same time, I don't want to speak for anyone. So I'm speaking for myself, I'm speaking my own words, and I'm citing the words of colleagues who have shared them with me um, personally, but also colleagues who have shared them with through their writings. Uh, and I'm referring throughout my presentation to their words. Um, I also uh, will consider the possibility of doing feminist work in the current time, doing it differently and doing it how, um, and reflect a little bit on intersectionality, very marginally on categorization and the ethical and methodological dilemma, dilemmas of, posed by doing intersectional research. As a white woman from the global north. However, and here I go to consider categorization. Nothing is so simple. Uh, and I want to problematize categories. Um, I'll do it, as said, marginally, but I would like to keep this in mind. Um, the, the, the issues that we associate to categories, even to, um, not to the, the, problemat the problematics associated to words such as feminism um, and praxis and theories and so on. So I said I'm from the Global North, but I'm also from the border between the Global North and the Global South. Uh, my accent reveals this, uh, but my appearance actually does not. Um, and again, um, to pro problematize categorization, um, my appearance is the results of colonization, but the colonization done to, to us, um, to the inhabitants of um, the islands from where um, my parents come from. Um, the islands that then became a part of a country that has done colonization to others, to others further down the south of the, um, of the hemisphere. So um, 
because I said that I'm not going to self-indulge um, in my own um, uh, in myself, I'm going to to move on to consider um, feminism. So, in considering feminism, I want to reflect first on what Cinzia Arruzza, Titi Bhattacharya, and Nancy Fraser asserted in their manifesto, Feminism for the 99%. Feminism should focus on the woman at the bottom, they say. Um, should fight for the world these women deserve. They argue that feminism must be anti-capitalist, eco-socialist and anti-racist. They urge feminists to connect with anti-racist, with environmentalists, with migrant rights activists, with labour activists to rise to the challenge of our time. What are the challenges of our time? I think we all know uh, the, challenge, the biggest challenge of our time is the current crisis. Is an economic, is it an ecological, is a political crisis, is an health and care crisis, is a peace and security crisis. Um, Arutza and Bhattacharya and Fraser argue that the crisis we live in is a crisis of the globalizing, financialized, neoliberal, and I quote them, viciously predatory form of capitalism we inhabit. This form of capitalism exploits wage labour and free rides on nature, on public goods and on reproductive labour. When they wrote their book in 2019, not long ago, but it seems ages compared to what's happened since then, uh, we've had COVID-19, we had the current Ukrainian or Russian war, um, and these are not exacerbated. Uh, yet the crisis. So we are going, the crisis is not improving, the crisis is getting worse. So they also argue that liberal feminism is part of this problem. It is centered in the global north among the higher middle class and is dedicated to help professional women to climb the corporate ladder. Yes, Liberal feminism advocates freedom of choices, but also refuses to address the structural socioeconomic constraints that make it possible for women, all women, to achieve freedom and empowerment. So they recognize the beneficiaries of liberal feminism are those who are socially, culturally and economic advantaged. Um, the Liberal feminists permit to lean on on the poorly paid migrant women that those women who lean in employ to do the care and the housework. So what Arut Sabatacharya and Fraser propose in place of a lean in feminism, and obviously the lean in is a quote to Sandberg um, or a reference to Sandberg. Sandberg's book, they, as, uh, they propose a kickback feminism or, as uh, mentioned already, a feminism for the 99%. They acknowledge the feminist strikes started a few years ago uh, and other movements across, across the globe. They suggest that this new wave of militant feminism, feminist activism is aimed for the impossible. And the impossible is the demands for um, bread, the bread that was taken away by decades of uh, neoliberalism. And I think probably for us, um, um, a privileged group, uh, I would include our pensions as well. But it's also, uh, so it's uh, expecting bread, but also expected roses. The beauty that nourishes our spirit through rebellion, so in the forms of strikes or demonstration or blockades or solidarity marches and so on and so forth. So we moved on then to solidarity. A, a feminist for the 99% is 
uh, a movement that places emphasis on solidarity with the capital S. Liberal feminism that is also called by some white feminism is only nominally inclusive. The inclusion is dependent on the white, white women being at the center of those who grant the inclusion. Hallison Pips in a, in a book, Me Not You, um, reports that the Me Too movement, which was started by a woman of color, was soon hijacked by, hijacked it by white women. And then became a conversation between, between white privileged women speaking out and white privileged men defending themselves. So white feminists speak for our groups, uh, sorry, they speak for other groups. They are experts, they're saviors, or we are experts, we are savior. We embody the narcissism, narcissism of white identity without acknowledging our role in the violence of racial capitalism and white supremacy. So the feminists for the 99%, as I said, that is grounded on solidarity and champions the need of all women, of the racialized, of the migrant, of the trans or gender non-conforming women. It is for the housewives, for the sex workers, for the unemployed, for the disabled women. It stands for all who are oppress oppressed and exploited. And uh, they also add, not just for women, uh, it needs to find solidarity and embrace class struggle in general, the fight against racism, the fight for environmental justice, for free education, for free health care, for labour rights. This rem remind me a bit of um, uh, Arendt's uh, views on equality, obviously within a specific uh, historical context. Uh, but she um, she argued that equality has to extend below beyond the language, the ethnicity, the religions, to those who nobody ever choose to be around. So from solidarity, therefore, I move to praxis. Praxis is the intersection of theory and practice. I said at the beginning, really, um, uh, there is no, or there can't be separation, separation between theory and practice specifically in relation to feminism. Uh, but practice involves a set of actions which are informed by theory and by evidence. One, therefore, can argue the praxis is politics. Pla uh, Paulo Freire defines praxis as action that is informed and is linked to certain values. Praxis is about deepening our understanding, but is a form of knowing based of, on action. It's part of making a difference in the world. Uh, it, it links dialogue to practice. So dialogue is also action for, for um, Freire. It's, it's a, a, a cooperative activity which involves respect and can be seen as an ancient community, to building cap social capital and leading to acts that make for justice and for human flourishing. He argued for informed action and what is informed action action that is never far from theory. So to gain knowledge about social reality, we must act together upon, upon the environment. We must reflect upon our reality so that we can transform it through further action and critical reflection. Feminist practice um, brings together ideology, theory, methodology, in a relational onto epistemology. The some argue that is an onto epistemology that is embodied. Elaine Swan, she, she cites um, Linason and she writes that making knowledge is about being attentive to the world through embodied relations. 
Uh, for Sara Ahmed, feminism is practice. We enact a world we are aiming for and nothing less we will do. This is a quote. So as a politic of transformation, feminism is a politics that intend to cause the end of a system, the end of oppression. It is not a program of action that being separated from how we live the world. So practice is theory. And I will um, I will reflect a little bit more um, further on down, further on in the presentation about um, the relationship between uh, theory and practice of um, uh, Sarah Ahmed. So um, feminist theories is pra praxis and praxis is, um, is theory. So the feminist theories comes out of the sense making process of becoming a feminist. Sort of of our navigating uh, through the world we live in. In uh, in Living a Feminist Life, the book that was published, um, I think was in 2017. Yep, that's right. Um, she argues that um, through the efforts to transform institution, diversity. Um, ex diversity practitioners she used the word practitioners um, but anyone who acts um, uh, as, a, as an activist through the through the effort to transform institution we generate knowledge about them so um, Ahmed rejects the idea that the academy gave her the theories that inform her practice as a um, as a diversity practitioner. She argues for diverse. She says that her work as a diversity practitioner and listening to other practitioners talk about their diversity work has shaped a theoretical understanding of how institutions work. She also says that um, feminist theory is an affective inheritance. So our experience become part of the theory and becomes part of the wider struggle. Um, she says the feminist is a problem of will. Praxis is entangled with willful, willfulness, as she calls it, and feminism is entangled with willfulness. The way in which we address subjectivities, whose subjectivities become a problem is part of a, a feminist practice. She says that in society there is a perception of feminist subjects as having too much will or too much subjectivity or being just too much. She said this affects how we experience ourselves as feminists as well as um, the world we we live in. We, in in becoming, we also um, become willing to obey, and becoming willing to obey avoid the costs of not being willing. So a willing girl is willing to obey. So she's willing not to have a will of her own. So where are we left then in relation to feminist practice? We can get back to what we said about at the beginning of our presentation of the feminist of the 99% of Nancy Fraser. She's, I'm not excluding uh, um, uh, Aruta and uh, Bhattacharya, she's actually the person who coined the term. Um, but we can, so we can engage with feminist solidarity but we need to face the fact that, as I mentioned um, uh, earlier on in the presentation, feminism himself um, as a knowledge praxis is embedded in whiteness. Alison Phipps used the term political whiteness to say that whiteness is politic. 
is political, sorry. Um, Elaine Swan, she outlines uh, uh, a white feminist practice praxis for diversity research that is based on challenging ignorance, on uh, um, listening, on uh, um, the labour of listening, on generous encounters and on social change. So what does it mean? What does uh, um, challenging ignorance mean? Uh, as white feminists, um, we start to explore, we, we should uh, explore our epistemic ig community ignorance. We should explore how our practice of knowing, unknowing and not knowing is related to colonialism, to racism, but also it's motivated, it's self-serving, it's deliberate. So our positionality affects the question we ask and why ignorance involves not asking certain questions to protect ourselves. So some critical race theory, she says, questions the sort of willingness, but also the ability of white people to be to challenge ignorance. Um, and therefore, some um, critical race theories thinks that this is not possible. While other believes that some white people, some of the time and to some degree, can actually manage to abort white supremacy. They want to find better ways to do things, not doing it. Uh, sometimes or doing it wrong sometimes or um, occasionally, very occasionally doing it right. And I'll get back to um, to the, my, the title of my presentation. Um, Elaine Swan, I have to say one thing, I interrupt the presentation. I can't see the comments because I'm doing it, the presentation mode. So I'll have to wait uh, until the end. I'm not too far uh, before um, engaging with their comments, apologies. Um, so in terms of listening, um, obviously equality praxis, um, Swan suggests it needs white people to listen carefully to uh, the exposes or racist by racially minoritized others. We need to listen how racing structure their life, structures their presence, present. We should learn about our own and others form of rationalization. So how do we operate in organization, including in, in university? So in listening, we should stop being controlling and dominating, which is what us white have learned um, since colonial, uh, colonialization. So the labor of listening, again, listening is a labor. It's difficult for white people to listen to account for racism, to acknowledge how they benefit from rationalized structure. Um, the four is a labor, it's painful, it's hard for white people to do so. But we can do through gener we can do this through generous encounter or try at least attempt to do this through generous encounter to acknowledge that uh, in order to understand whiteness, but also to acknowledge racism, we need to encounter the other, we need to get close to uh, to them in an in an embodied way to understand our structures of power mediate or frame the encounter itself. So as white feminists, we need to remember that whiteness is produced through the work we do. It's produced to our through, through our research. It's produced through our methods, through the concept that we use, the resources we use. Is reproduce produce and reproduce through our writings. So. Um, from this, obviously, we need to affect change. We need social change. We need to go beyond the listening, the encounters with rationalized women and men in our research, in our teaching. We need white feminists 
as white feminists, we need to get involved in activist struggle for racial justice, um, for building an anti-racist community um, by, um, how can I say, I'm trying to get the word engaging, I don't know whether it's the right word engaging, but listening is the word that um, um, Swan used, with, working with black and monetarized activity groups. So um, if we don't get close to those who are, uh, I use a new word, otherized by us, they're made other by us, by society, they can't be change or they can't be much change. So um, I get back to intersectionality. Um, I'm, um, I've said in my in the um, in the blurb that I was going to engage with intersectionality. Looking at the time, I don't think I've got uh, much time to engage with intersectionality. But um, intersectionality, the, in, an intersectional approach, is um, one second. Oh, sorry. An intersectional approach is uh, in, in order, an intersectional approach. What it means, it means that engages with uh, the combined forces of gender, but also of race, um, of sexuality, of uh, um, of age, of disability, of class. Um, engaging means that some of us might, um, might feel some of the um, oppressive effect of a combination of one, two or more um, of these systems of oppression. Intersectionality, um, I was um, I was saying also, um, need to acknowledge coloniality, uh, need to an acknowledge capitalism, as I, um, I think you can, uh, you can read there, as, as, um, as, I, as I put, intersectionality is also much more, and I think I want to go back to um, the liberal feminism or um, the uh, how uh, li or white feminism and liberal feminists has actually use, used and uses the tools of capitalism to create an hierarchy, to create an hierarchy of, of women while professional women at the top gone all the way down to black women and also to exclude um, transgender women. And I want to go back again to uh, what we, what I said um, when I said it reminds me of um, um, the sort of feminism on the, of the 99% uh, reminds me a bit of uh, uh, the political of obligation of um, a rent, which is an obligation to the unchosen people, uh, to the people that are at the bottom. So um, I was told to spend 20 minutes to um, offer some thoughts and then discuss and I think there will be some um, uh, some questions. So I want to apologize for the rambling it's trying to cover a little bit too much too fast uh from going a little bit all over the feminist place um people have written books over books um on the few concepts i've tried to highlight and i've i've tried to condense probably too much in this presentation but um i want to conclude from a, a place of exasperation um, and I want to conclude with Mafalda, 
uh, who says basta. With um, in doing so, I'm actually excluding all of those who can't understand Italian. Um, so basta means enough if we translate it in um, in English. So um, also, I want to ask you if you have any questions uh, in a way that, that is, you know, with my eyes open. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll let's start uh, the, our conversation. Thank you very much. I'll stop presenting. Thank you, Cinzia. So we do have some questions in the chat box. Yes. Uh, was... Yeah, oh, so oh, Nella is uh, saying, in light of feminism for 99% you draw on, I was wondering what is your reading of Sylvia Federici's claim that the postmodern turn in theory has curtailed our ability as feminists to provide a valuable critique of capitalist relations and its racist, sexist, ableist, ages uh, manifestations. Um, OK, I'll, I can see the question. Yeah, um, possibly I agree um, that the postmodern turn has curtailed our ability um, to um, to engage with um, with the material effects of uh, of of capitalism, with the material effects of racism and ableism. But I also think that. Um, She's right in saying so. She also thinks that there are, there is evidence that things are moving. Um, the material turn in the social science is not a, um, you know, a chance. Um, and that is, it was obviously um, encouraged by um, ecological, um, e ecological concerns but also developing a development of technology. Um, so, yes, we are moving, I think, away from uh, postmodern, the postmodern turn to a mom to look at the material turn, the material effect of, of capitalism, the material effects of ideologies, the material effects of um, colonialism and so on and so forth. So uh, yes, it as postmodern in a postmodern in the language turn in a way as taken as a way. But if we look, if we consider uh, the historical time, it wasn't long ago, 50, 40 years ago, um, it, we were, it was a more optimistic world. It was a, a, the optimism was the result of capitalism, but we felt more optimistic. We felt the possibility of possibly some, not everyone, but we felt the possibility of, um, and I'm talking about more, um, that we, it's sort of if we think about the UK, new labour almost offered the possibility to many of, um, you know, sharing the wealth of capitalism. But in, you know, this is not um, translated. It, this is translated actually in greater um, division, in greater uh, um, discrepancy between the poor and the richer and so on and so forth. So I think there are other questions. I'm not, do you want me to read the more? Do you want to? Up to you, do you too? Because there is one uh, related question as well. You can skip mine. Uh, but it's uh, how should we respond to post-feminist critiques? So if you would like to respond to it. How should we respond to post-feminist critique? Um, in what sense? Sorry, Avi. Um, can you build a little bit on that? Yes, definitely. Um, I, I I was thinking here in terms of um, uh, the the kind of your reflections and and how we have 
moved forward throughout the throughout the centuries, really. Um, but we're at the point where it seems like there is a lot of backlash uh, in the post-Trump era, um, if you like. And um, there are um, uh, kind of powerful critics that um, uh, kind of advocate that you know feminism is is dead. Um, so, in what ways can we can we move forward? Is it, is it worth actually responding to these uh, critiques, or uh, should we just ignore them? Um, no, I think there is some foundation on the critique. But again, uh, feminism is dead. Um, feminism is not dead um, to start with. But also, we need to think which feminism. Um, and you know, I've I've not engaged much in my presentation with you know different type of feminists but um you know as as the feminist for the 99 percent manifesto highlight the two extreme you know they they sort of position their feminists of the 99 percent um as as the opposite literally you know the opposite side to liberal feminism and in between there are a sort of all other type of uh, you know lived experiences or, or other types of feminist struggles not other types but it's sort of uh, you know in between um, forms and certainly you know if I go back to to what I said the presentation it's not dead but the answer is, is solidarity the answer uh, to feminists? I suppose the, the backlash is let's stop isolating ourselves, let's engage with um, and a sort of be, become be solidar in solidarity with um, with other activists group with a. Um, environmentalist group with with the labor movement um and and so on so um let's stop about an exclusionary um feminism whether it's exclusionary of uh, uh, transgender women or is exclusionary of uh black women or uh, disabled women or exclusionary of men to an extent and with men i'm obviously referring to the men that are struggling in their um commitment to a just world in a commitment to um, um health uh, and education in their commitment to um an environment, an healthy environment, and so on. I hope I've addressed your question, Avi. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, that's wonderful. So, Marco, he asked you another question. So, thank you very much for your fascinating talk, Chinzia. Listening to it, I couldn't help but thinking of Tolois and Guatri, idea of becoming women and becoming minoritarian to shake the capitalist, patriarchal, social order. How do you think white cis males can contribute to feminist and minorities struggles? Thank you, Marco. This is a very difficult question, which from my, my ex PhD student, <laughs> he should have um, been a bit more gentle. Um, but um, so how could we uh, how could we engage with the sort of Deleuze and Guattari idea of becoming woman, um, becoming minoritarian? Um, I think um, I'll, I'll go back to actually to Sarah Ahmed in, a, in Living a Feminist Life and she uh, at some point in the book she thinks about I think it was a, 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 a story about a little girl becoming um, a willing subject I think I, I talked about willingness in my in, in my presentation so uh, becoming um, again becoming witch woman and becoming um, minoritarian and I uh, it's, it's, it's a big, I'm trying to probably complicate it. So the becoming, I want to go back actually to um, my presentation, just a second. Uh, 
So, um, it's sort of, we understand uh, the experiences or, or sort of we understand the inclusions, we understand oppressions, we learn uh, through making sense of being in the world. Um, and how do white cheese men can contribute to feminist and minority struggles? Um, they can contribute in the same ways as um, the points, for example, I highlighted before, uh, the same ways as white women can uh, um, can become or sort of sort of they can encounter they can go close you know the bridge of uh, the Lers and Guattari they can um, listen they can do labor they can do the same things that Swan um, uh, put in, uh, wrote in a paper which I uh, presented earlier on so they can listen the labor of listening they can uh, go close to the struggles um, uh, of women I hope this is enough. I, I, I was ranting a little I bit. I just, uh, yes. No, that's, that's wonderful. I just I just have one question. Actually, I had two questions, but I'm going to just stick to one. So uh, how does, like, how do you navigate your way around being a feminist in the academy? Is it is it easy to be a feminist and to work in an academy? Or how, how, how do you, but I, actually we have two minutes left, so maybe we can have it separately. But I wonder often, is it difficult to be a feminist and work in an academy university? It is. Uh, I can only conclude it is, and I can only refer back to uh, to the title of my presentation, um, getting it wrong. I get a very few things right. I get lots of things wrong. Um, and I hope people tell me uh, when I get it wrong. I don't get, um, I don't get, um, I get hurt, I suppose, in my whiteness, um, uh, but I, I don't get, um, I don't get offended. I try to, I try to learn. Thank you very much.